Hi, welcome back for episode 13, season 2 of Poetry with Proteus. Um, can you believe we've had 13 episodes? Wow. That's a lot of poetry. Okay, so today we're only doing two pieces because they're long, they're lengthy. Um, both of them sort of focus on transcending or processes of becoming, processes of change. Um, this first process or this first piece is called Unbreaking and it was the first real piece that was truly instrumental in me um, starting to love myself, starting to forgive myself, starting to um, not think that um, my worth was tied to my social approval. And it changed me. It changed me a lot. It's called Unbreaking. How can I be this broken and yet still breathing, taking life in and out through my mouth and still not feeling because the nerves that wired me together were severed with every blow in this life. So sit here I sit, broken and numb and feeling dumbfounded that nobody pieced me together yet, that nobody noticed the mess I was in or the mess inside me, like cracked glass shattered, but still one piece. But that's not true. That's just how it looks because I know there are pieces, missing pieces that others took, pieces lost over long years, pieces diminished by hate or fear, pieces erased through the constant wear of doubt, pieces divulged to a lover's mouth, pieces in storage waiting for their moment, a piece or two so painful I could just no longer hold it. But somehow, outside, some trick of the light denied my battered and broken inside. There was a time before I knew I was broken, but hindsight shows that I've always been. I used to think that this should just be my end, that this was my normal place in the natural world, insignificant girl. But I look around me every day at others who don't carry this kind of pain, or maybe it's just the same light trick, more than some glue that sticks their pieces together, but sometimes I dream that I could be whole that I could transcend the lies I've been told and be an entity unto myself, sovereign and free. That I could stop humoring convention to avoid the condemnation of my dissension. That maybe I've learned from all the experience and sorted through it and made enough sense to put the pieces of the past where they belong and only carry the lesson along and stop playing and all the same wrong and stop allowing all the same wrong Maybe instead I could choose right things, obvious and in front of me. Maybe I could replace twisted motives with alignment. Maybe I could leave this confinement. Maybe I could fill and make healthy and whole all of the chambers, now empty and cold, but all of this emotional transitioning up is lonely as hell because friends abruptly dismiss someone for spackling her own heart and soul. The doormat that I've been benefited every person I know. The caboose that follows others in tow. The sacrificial lamb ready to be handed over in a slick and practiced maneuver. If you think of your own friends, you'll probably see one that you give up on more easily. One that you neglect more readily. One that consoles you when you shit on her. One that holds on to nothing in her own world. And in my universe, it came to be that the first penguin to jump was always me raising the bar and taking it for the team, taking it to a new level. It's no surprise, really, that my desire for transformation would set others reeling. But here I am seeing it all, and for once I'm reluctant to take the fall. For once I'm thinking it's not my turn or my job or my cute little hobby to position everyone else before me. But this emotional transitioning up is like pushing against a membrane, refusing to rupture. But now I know better and I can't go back to tangled toxicity seeping through cracks in myself. I can do more. I can be more than anybody's been before. And this must be what it would mean to be a caterpillar on the brink at the moment when it ceases to be anything it's ever been before. There comes a time when the threat of the lonely and the rejection that left you roaming to find acceptance becomes your shelter, becomes your haven from life's weather. That loneliness that kept me apart is now the solace and salvation of my heart. 
This isn't the first wild hair I've had to create the change diminishing the bad, but I wouldn't let go of those who enforced my place. So many dialogues in my brain of all the reasons to stay the same, and every obligation owed and skewed accounting, which in retrospect was amounting to the same breaking time and again from foes no more readily than friends. And all of this time when I knew better but still lived life to the letter is the dissonance that broke me becoming the dissonance that woke me, fully knowing now in control, transforming loneliness into a safety zone, access controlled in every direction to prevent conceding to others' conventions, because I know now it's a choice whether to stay broken or use your voice, and I know the years I've wasted could have tasted sweeter, and I know the years I've wasted should have tasted better, the price of every wasted year paid in pieces of myself pieces that I will never that will never return some pieces that I still mourn and how many more can I mourn before I can't be fixed how many more before I turn wicked life is a blessing and it's temporary and if I know better and still piss it away in the breeze then I never deserved it to begin with and why the hell should I be obligated to choosing others who never choose me? No, I'll keep those who participate in reciprocity as a litmus test to determine friend from enemy, because for the first time, I don't feel I need to hold on just because I don't know what I'll be when you're gone. My love affair with my own future requires a change in my fortune, and I can. I can know better. I can choose me. I can find better things to be. I can be healthy, and I can be whole in my mind, my body, and my soul. I can love others who also love me, and I'll be amazed at the things I can be. I can inspire, and I can choose greatness, and I can take hold of my life in this lateness. I've learned all I can, and I'm done looking back. And I'm ready to get my life on track, and I'm ready to do whatever it takes to repair all the bends and breaks and bruises and memories and start living my fantasies. Why have I stayed broken so long? Why was I partied all of the drama? Why so easy for me not to see that a person was unmade in me? I knew her once. She's a memory now. Someone I could no longer perform anyhow. This woman who was once the way that I thought. Now someone I shake my head at thinking she ought to know better. To be better. I am changed. I am changing. Broken pieces take on different meaning. Suffering still permeates my empty spaces, but now leaves room for cozy places and in the irreversible filtration, transforming into clarity and light, I can see the other side. I can feel hope in the pain and refuse to abstain from living. See, this knowing is power that within a single hour can rewire and rebuild and strengthen the will of even the broken, the battered and lost and those who have paid too great a cost of those like me who've been waiting, feeling like they're suffocating. This is the part where I get up. I'll admit that I'm scared, sure enough. We always fear what we don't know, but this desolation cannot be my home. So this is the part where I get up. This is the part where I believe. This is the part where I pick me. This is the part where I set free a force of nature inside of me to become the person I want to be and live the life I deserve to lead. Told you it was lengthy. That was eight and a half minutes. I need a drink. Uh. Um, the next piece is called The Woman Left Behind. Which, at the time, I was going to take my first 27 pieces and put them together in one stage production. And the whole thing was going to be called The Woman Left Behind. And this was sort of the title piece of that. <coughs> it never happened, but it still could. There's a lot more pieces now, though. And be, uh, it would need an intermission. Um, the woman left behind. Sometimes I carry the weight of my past like a metaphoric inversion of my life's hourglass. I was always the fat one. The girl in gym class who couldn't break into a run. The girl whose chair was swapped for one broken because the joke is so much better when a fat ass has fallen. I was the girl who constantly heard a constant haranguing from both jocks and nerds, fatty, fatty, two by four, and my life became a world of more, more food in, more drastic failures, more fighting with sin, more cloth to the tailor. Consuming was the only thing that felt good, but I ate for reasons deeper than my mood. It wasn't until I was 23 that I learned how my biology was incompatible with most of the American diet, and very briefly I was able to try it. I found a different way of eating about 
all or thinking about all of the things that I was eating all the years that everyone told me you can have the baked potato just put the butter on hold please when the butter was the part that my body needs and the potato was secretly killing me but I found this different way of thinking which questions how humans evolved for eating and considers diets from around the globe and questions the health outcomes and probes into pondering what's actually food and which processed concoctions contain things obnoxious to our bodies and minds leaving us all in a bind because the shit on the shelves is the work of the devil eroding away my insulin response as the secrets of the pyramid ensconced the truth behind what my body needed and what would keep my heart beating so I found this new way of understanding nutrition, but its enactment at 25 caused some attrition. <sighs> he felt it was my job to cook what he wanted. And so I found myself confronted with 298 glaring from the scale and the knowledge I needed, but he derailed me. Every meal became a fight, thinking he'd rather have me dead, made me leave him behind. But then life got messy and I didn't have the resources for fresh meat and produce while attending courses. Not when ramen is 10 cents per pack. And I didn't have enough pennies to stack. So in stretching the dollar till I saw it bleed, I had to take food that was easy and free. Those are the foods that never go bad, laced with chemicals and clad in a box on a sh or a can to sit on the shelf. If it can't go bad, it's not food. Can't you tell? But these are the things fit to feed the poor, sometimes lacking access to a grocery store. And we survived off convenience store fare because I couldn't afford a taxi to get us there. And I was willing to walk, but didn't have the time for an extra three miles by foot without a public bus line. You see, food's not always within our control. Even when we're educated and we know better, See, every time my blood sugar spikes, my body sends all of the insulin it likes, it dumps it all in one big load, even though my sugar spike threshold is low. So then my sugar bottoms out, and that's what brings the cravings about, sends a signal to my brain that I must be starving, and the signal to eat becomes overwhelming, alarming, and it consumes everything you think until you find something else to eat, unless you never let it spike by carefully balancing it below the line. And this is what I learned to do, but food is social, let me tell you. And so all of the verbal abuse, abuse I was given from all of those years of fat piggy living became a running commentary on how my habits weren't ordinary. I never guessed people would be offended if I took the bun off of my own burger, since when did people have to intervene so much upon what someone else is having for lunch? And all of the friends that I couldn't make because I was so fat became friends that were unmade in dinnertime spats because I couldn't eat the things that they would serve. And I was already lacking in social nerve. Food became a private event, but a place to explore and create and invent. And the food I ate now is so much better than the stuff packaged up in labels with letters. But before I finally got stable enough to put what I wanted on the table, the scale told the tale of me at 350. And even trying to move was shifty. My joints ached every day to the point where I couldn't walk or sway, and so much swelling was added to, to mass to keep me out of aerobics class. So many problems inside my body. Weight is only one pathology. By the time I could start to pull this off, the symptoms mounted to a real cost. I'd spent four years shitting blood. Constant presence of phlegmy crud. And now it was getting to the point that my vision was turning on and off, waiting for a cataclysm. So there I was staring at Halloween candy, knowing if I didn't get a handle on this, I would be dead. Dead before my children really know me. Dead before I accomplished anything noteworthy. Just wanting my time, or wasting my time day after day if I was just going to throw away my health. So I made some changes and lost some friends, and as I shrunk, so did my world at both ends. But that was okay, because I got a little stronger, and I could stand to exert myself a little longer. And once the crap stopped going in, several things normalized again. By the time I was seeking a master's degree, I'd 
had my weight down to 230. That's 120 pounds I had lost. But in the celebration, there's a cost. Because I barely remember the woman I was who was cooking dinner while wearing a muzzle, consuming life in a way that pleased others, and putting what everyone wanted before her. But that was my identity that stretched back 30 years, and this transformation left me unrecognizable to my peers. When I run into someone who hasn't seen me in a while and greet them with warm words and a smile, they stand and they stammer and try to remember, who's this person who thinks they're so clever? And sometimes I know they walk away without being able to place my face because I still carry a hint of the eyes and the same voice and the same smile. But all of the extra weight that I carried was a veil into the world I was buried. And now that I'm out, nobody knows me. It's like starting over and being free. But the crux is in order for me to find me, there was a whole woman left behind. Not that I mind, but it took time. So many layers to my imprisonment where most of my years of my life were spent. Ideas about gender, ideas about race, ideas about religion and my fall from grace, ideas about ability that tainted my identity. And I'm not someone who ever wanted to hide or lie about how I feel on the inside. But in a life filled with constant change and no guidance, it's a rough, long journey for each of us to find it. Almost four decades of my life spent just trying to put words to my otherness. Just trying to wrap my head around reasons I never fit from my head to the ground. Now that I've shed the box I was assigned and shed countless other boxes over time and redefined and retrofit and decided I'm just done with it. I'm done with all the binaries choosing from only two options repeatedly and it never mattered what I changed to try to live my life the assigned way it never mattered how I changed my size or how much of me I tried to hide or how much of me I gave away becoming less through self-effacing if I'll never be worthy then I'll just be me a gender and non-binary Atheist now, as my journey continues, letting go of religious venues, coming to terms with the limits of my body, and also the wonders it birthed on this journey. An intersectional existence mingled with resistance. There was this woman that I tried to be, but she's a little more than a memory. And I love the person I was able to find, far more than the woman left behind. Have a great week. We'll see you again next week. Bye!